This video, like all my others, is brought to you by my wonderful patrons. In fiction writing, a character is more relatable to the reader or viewer the more they're seen to struggle and overcome. It's the reason character flaws are so prevalent in media and why the best stories generally aren't ones with perfectly moral, happy, healthy, or otherwise invincible characters. These inner struggles are rich with humanity and can ground the viewer in the character's emotions and help suspend disbelief even in an otherwise bonkers plotline. Fantasy in particular has a unique capability to take these struggles and manifest them physically through magic, like going into a character's literal memories to confront some past trauma, or setting up a bad guy monster that is the physical embodiment of fear to force characters to confront what frightens them most. Actually, now that I think about it, sci-fi can do the same with tech. Regardless, the possibilities are as endless as the writer's imagination. Now, Unless I'm mistaken, this concept doesn't really have a name outside the umbrella term of plot device, though I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. A real man never takes accountability! So for this video, at least, I'm going to call it Magic Literalism. The Owl House is a perfect example of how writers can effectively use magic literalism to make these character conflicts more dynamic and lighthearted, without losing the character growth and depth that such conflicts can provide. It uses the technique both often and effectively, and that's part of the reason why I love this series so much. So let's talk about it for the next… oh my god. The series was initially conceived in 2016 while creator Dana Terrace was working on the DuckTales cartoon reboot at Disney. For some reason, she wasn't feeling quite artistically fulfilled with redoing an already perfect series. What on earth could she have been thinking? Regardless, while working on that show, she came up with the idea that would later turn into the Owl House. I guess she wasn't satisfied with Dirty Pond Birds, so she upgraded to Hooters instead. I think we can all relate to bored daydreaming at work, but Terrace managed to turn hers into a multi-season cartoon at the House of Mouse. My editor wanted me to add, no wonder she struggled with Disney, owls love to eat mice. That, that's pretty impressive. The, the getting her own show part, not the bad joke. In an interview, Terrace stated that she created the show out of spite, as a writing partner had called the initial idea boring. So naturally, she scribed a 15-page show bible and pitched to Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, before eventually being accepted by Disney. The initial concept was inspired by the work of such titans of artistic expression as Hieronymus Bosch, Remedios Vero, and… Pokemon? It makes sense, I guess, considering the shape and history of the Boiling Isles and the hauntingly beautiful, emphasis on haunting, character and creature designs of the show. For example, this freaky finger dragon that would feel right at home in Dark Souls. Terrace based a lot of the elements of the show on her own life, and the characters on herself and friends from high school, injecting even more humanity into the show. And I think that's part of the reason why fans connect so much with the series, as they can feel part of themselves in it. She talks about growing up in Connecticut and how it inspired the fictional human town of Gravesfield. And I think that many people can relate to these kinds of childhood experiences. I used to live near an abandoned women's prison, and one of my pastimes was getting lost in the woods and exploring those hallways and probably putting myself in stupid situations. But I feel like that's such a part of a teenager's life in Connecticut. It felt like a natural parallel to put Luz in. Terrace, being part of the LGBTQ community, definitely colored the creation of the show as well, giving us some wonderful representation in the characters of Luz, Amity, Rain, and others in the main and supporting casts. The Owl House was breaking new ground for Disney. It was not only the first series to feature a bisexual main character, but also the first to feature a same-sex kiss between leads, and the inclusion of non-binary characters, plural. Also, as much of the show is set in an alternate dimension where Puritan values never took hold, the characters are allowed to express their orientation without fear of oppression, and personally, I think this is nice. While it's good for media to acknowledge the struggle of queer people in the real world, it's also sometimes nice when writers are able to sidestep those things to allow us to see characters existing and interacting with the world without all that baggage. While perfect characters are boring, perfect societies, at least in some aspects, provide a sort of escapism, even just for a bit. Plus, there's plenty more for the characters to worry about in the Owl House, including an allegory for queer and neurodivergent oppression. But it's not about that directly, so my previous point still stands. 
Anyways, if you haven't watched the series yet, now is your chance to dip on out because I will be spoiling things going forward. Bye! The show follows the protagonist Luz in a sort of fish out of water story as she wanders through a portal into the demon realm and onto an archipelago called the Boiling Isles, where magic and fantastical creatures are all real. There, she befriends a witch named Ida and a cute little fuzzy wuzzy demon named King. The three go through many adventures together, and Luz makes even more friends at a totally not Hogwarts magical school. Eventually, it's revealed that not everything on the Isles is just fun hijinks. Probably should have guessed that since they're literally made of a corpse of a giant creature, after all. But the witches have all been indoctrinated into the coven system, which limits their magical expression and forces them into a metaphorical box. All of this was instigated by the Emperor of the Isles, Belos, who is prejudiced against the very witches he rules over. And so, the show becomes a resistance narrative, following Luz and her friends in their fight against the oppressive Emperor's regime. Helping the audience invest in this storyline are the voice actors, who truly do a fantastic job despite not being stacked with big names like Over the Garden Wall. Generally speaking, the mark of good voice acting is when the viewer doesn't even notice it, when the voices fit the characters perfectly and we're able to immerse ourselves in the world without any layers of unreality. That being said, Ida is voiced by Wendy Malick, who also voiced the mother of Bojack Horseman, and she brings that same level of sarcastic disinterest to Ida's character. Oh, and what's this letter I have? It's from the government saying, I'm proud of you. Are you? Oh, no. No, actually, what I'm holding is nothing. Though she does a great job at tempering it with an initially hidden softness for Luz and King. I don't regret anything. I lived freely, and I got to meet you. Since the show's release, it's gained a wide following from viewers of all ages. I first heard about it on Imgur, where it has a large presence in the form of fan comics that extend the story. On TikTok, the story is even crazier, where the show has over 12 billion hashtag views, far higher than the next closest series, Gravity Falls. Granted, that show has been off the air for seven years, but still. So to say that fans are pretty passionate about the Owl House is a bit of an understatement, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I can only imagine that Terrace loves the way that fans have connected with the characters and the story she created. And they showed that love with their viewership as well, as the final season premiere has garnered nearly 7 million views on YouTube alone. In addition to all the fan support, the show also won a Peabody Award in 2021 for children's programming, and has been a critical darling overall. In particular, the Evangelical Christian Broadcasting Network called it a witch's agenda to make witchcraft look positive. So, you know it's good. Anyways, enough preamble, let's unpack the Owl House. So, tonal whiplash incoming, I have to admit that initially I was not sold on the show. I put it on one evening when I had time to just binge it, but pretty quickly found myself disengaged and eventually fell asleep. However, when I woke up at nearly the end of the first season, that immediately changed. The tone, just like this video, had completely shifted. Things were getting serious in a way that I had not expected, and suddenly my eyes were glued to the screen. The reason for this is that season one is kind of a slow burn. It doesn't rush to get to the main plot, which really doesn't kick in until episode 18, the penultimate episode of the season. It wasn't really until that point that I was truly gripped by the story. So for this video, since the plots of the individual episodes of season 1 largely don't affect the main story, I won't be focusing on said plots. For the most part. That doesn't mean these episodes are unimportant to the story, though. Far from it. The bulk of Season 1 is spent building up the large cast of characters, the magic systems, and the lore surrounding the Boiling Isles. It's quite a bit to get through, and on my second viewing I much more appreciated what the writers were doing with this time. It makes it so that, by the time shit starts to go down, the viewer is already invested and connected to the characters. So instead, I'll be focusing on those elements, and how they're developed overall through these episodes. We begin with Luz Noseda in the town of Gravesfield in the human world. Luz is an outcast, starved for adventure and excitement that isn't really reciprocated by any of her peers. So she remedies this by escaping into fantasy books like Azura the Witch and begins to act these things out. Of course, this only causes those other children to ostracize her even further. At this point in the story, we really don't know why she finds normal life so boring, but 
Even still, can you really blame her? We see her mother, Camilla, initially from Luz's perspective. She's a single mom who works as a vet or vet tech, not really sure. At this point in the story, not having the full context of their relationship, it seems like she's close-mindedly trying to stifle Luz's imagination by forcing her to conform to societal expectations via a summer camp program. That's when a chance encounter leads Luz to step through a doorway out of her world and into the demon realm. She is lured by a witch named Ida, who took her beloved Azura book. Just like Luz, Ida is an outcast in her own world. She doesn't fit in with proper witches, though, again, we don't quite know why, beyond the fact that she's a little weird. We will later find out that she's actually ostracizing herself because of some deep-seated trauma from childhood. She's interesting to Luz not only because she's a witch in a fantasy world, but also because she seems at peace with herself, at least outwardly, in a way that Luz just isn't. King is on the far side of the spectrum. He is a demon who believes himself to be, in fact, the king of all demons. He's kind of got a Napoleon syndrome, hating that he is seen as adorable and instead wanting to be feared and respected. Though he is later vindicated, for season one at least, this is shown as a delusion of his that Ida and later Luz play into. Together, the three of them raid the Emperor's palace, setting up the, uh, setting for later, in order to find King's Burger King crown. The place is literally called the Conformatorium, a bit on the nose, but it quickly conveys that being a weirdo isn't accepted on the Boiling Isles any more than it is in the human realm. At the end, the three are caught by this honestly kind of rippy prison warden who tries to forcibly coerce Ida into dating him. I hate everything you're saying right now. Eventually, they escape and even manage to free some of the Conformatorium's prisoners, including this Barbara Streisand-looking creature? Demon? And this chick. And I practice the ancient art of fan fiction! And Luz decides to stay in the demon realm, hiding the fact that she isn't actually at camp from her mother. Like I said, from here I'm going to focus less on plot and more on what the episode overall does for the narrative. In episode 2, it's really drilled home that the Boiling Isles aren't some fantastical escape that Luz initially believed. A wizard tricks her into thinking that she is the chosen one to get back at Ida by pumping up her ego with all the things she expected of the fantasy world, only to later reveal that it's all an illusion, hiding the grotesque truth underneath. Thanks for ruining the mood, Chris. So, in a nutshell, she has to learn the lesson that life is hard and anybody who tells you different is either lying or selling something. In the end, Ida shows Luz the boiling aisles from the air. From that vantage, everything looks peaceful just like the archetypal fantasy land. The irony of the episode is that Luz left the real world because she didn't quite fit in socially. It can be a really messed up place. So she ran away into this new world, but to her disappointment, it's basically the same. From up above, our world can look pretty beautiful too. The main function of the third episode is to introduce us to the magic school, Hexide, as well as to the rest of the supporting cast of season one, Willow, Gus, and Amity. In many aspects, the Owl House is a deconstruction or critique on Harry Potter. Both universes contain many similar elements. For instance, Grudgeby versus Quidditch. Or this. And now I feed. Willow is introduced as a shy introvert, bullied into believing herself to be a failure. Willow the half-witch. Except pretty early on, we learn that she's actually fantastic at horticulture magic. However, her self-esteem has been so damaged that she doesn't even realize this. Meanwhile, Gus is introduced to us as a human fanboy, collecting all sorts of human memorabilia, a la Mr. Weasley. Tell me, what exactly is the function of a rubber duck? At this point, he doesn't have much characterization other than the fact that he is an illusion wizard. However, we later learn that he too is struggling with self-confidence and anxiety. Only in his case, it isn't that he believes he's bad at magic, Rather, that illusion magic itself is weak, and so he struggles throughout the first part of the series, trying to become something else. In the episode, Luz attempts to help Willow cheat on an abomination magic test by pretending to be said abomination. This is when we first meet Amity Blight. Amity is honestly kind of a complete douche canoe when we first meet her. She spends most of season one acting as a bully primarily to Willow and to a lesser extent, Luz and Gus. It takes the show quite a few episodes before we truly begin to see a side of her that isn't outright shitty. However, this is recontextualized later when it's revealed that the attitude stems from a pretty toxic home life. 
There's even hints of this early on in her character design. Her hair is colored green just like her mom and siblings, but it's pretty clearly dyed as her roots have grown out. We'll have to wait until later to find out why. Episode 4 introduces Ida's curse, also the explanation of how witches are able to use magic. It comes from a sack of magic bile attached to a witch's heart. Oh, gross! Can I keep that? No. Bizarre choice, but I can dig it. The latter causes Luz to feel despair. She spent these first few episodes believing that she can become a witch just like Azura, yet every one of her naive ideas about this journey have been crushed in front of her. It leads her to making a poor choice and causing Ida's animalistic owl form to come out. Prior to this, Luz saw her as this indomitable spirit, powerful and carefree in every way, invincible. That ends here, though, when Luz sees firsthand just how mortal she is. The Curse of the Owl Beast is a pretty interesting topic. It could be a magical allegory for an incurable, socially stigmatized disease such as AIDS. It drives a wedge between Ida and everyone she cares for in her life, resulting in her being the loner we meet in the first episode. The curse is not her fault, of course. It was actually given to her by her sister. But don't force the connection there to AIDS because, ew. Neither she nor we know this at the time, though, but we do get a first hint when she has a flashback. All Ida can do is manage the curse with potions, read medicine, and even then, the jewel on her chest represents the magic slash time she has left before it consumes her. Kind of unrelated, but I really like the commitment of the bit of being the Owl Lady, as we see her bed is just a giant nest filled with shiny objects. 10 out of 10 attention to detail. Meanwhile, Luz uses her own strengths and creativity to learn magic in her own way. As a modern human, she has access to a smartphone, though how she keeps it charged, I have no idea. Regardless, she uses the phone to record Ida casting a spell and reviews the footage to try understanding how it works. And it pays off, too, as she notices a rune hidden in the casting, thus resulting in her first spell. Also, just wanted to mention that the Snaggleback Demon is voiced by none other than Aaron Hansen of Game Grumps. Don't know how much of our audience overlaps, but there you go. Episode 5 introduces some of the lore from the larger world, like the idea of covens, that witches choose and are then locked into a single form of magic. At this point in the story, the idea isn't really questioned. Instead, it seems that, just like the people of the Boiling Isles, the viewer is supposed to accept the concept as just a quirk of the world rather than the oppression that it truly is. It's also the first time that we meet Lilith, Ida's younger sister. The siblings have a rivalry, seemingly instigated by Lilith, though Ida plays right back into it. They use Luz and Amity in a proxy fight at a coven convention, and both cheat in the process. I haven't really discussed Hootie the house demon up until this point because he really hasn't been characterized as anything more than the butt of a joke, and will honestly stay that way until season 2 at least. However, in episode 6 that changes slightly when we finally see his true form as a living house, as while Ida is away, Luz and her friends perform a ritual that causes Hootie to pull up roots and begin walking around like it's Howl's Moving Castle, which was intentional based on the episode name. Mostly, though, the episode serves to build up the friendship between Luz, Gus, and Willow, and reveals that, at one time, Willow and Amity were friends. Episode 7 is the first time that we really see Amity as something other than a bully. There was a glimpse or two previously, but it's made much more clear how vulnerable she can be. Amity serves as a foil to Luz in this first season. Where Amity is talented and confident in those talents, she's also uncomfortable in her position as a prodigy, with all the familial expectations weighing on her. On the other hand, Luz is decidedly not naturally gifted in magic. She has to work for every little scrap. Yet she knows all of this, and is not only comfortable staying in her own lane, moisturized, flourishing, she's actively trying to better herself. Though we don't get to meet her mother until later, it's clear that changing her hair is Amity's way of trying to gain approval and affection. It's the same reason she's outwardly cruel to others. She's just emulating Mommy Dearest. In the episode, Luz befriends Amity's twin siblings and unwittingly becomes involved in a pretty nasty prank on their sister. However, despite their differences, the two are forced to work together to take down a magical monster. It shows both of them, and the audience, that they can overcome obstacles by working together, even if they aren't quite friends just yet. Now what? I don't know. I didn't even think that would work. I was all like, <laughs> It's also revealed that the two have something else in common, the Azura books. 
In both the human and demon realms, the books are seen as kind of lame and cringe, kind of like a 33-year-old man talking about a children's cartoon. So in at least one way, the two can understand each other. We've been circling around this one for a bit, but finally in episode 8, the show asks the question, if Ida is the most powerful witch on the Boiling Isles, as she claims, why is she in hiding? The whole episode is kind of a variety hour, operating as three mini-episodes as the main trio swap bodies and go on their own self-contained adventures. These kinds of slice-of-life, body-swap episodes are great because they not only give the characters a chance to see their companions' life firsthand and make them literally able to walk a mile in their shoes, they afford the audience that same opportunity. This is an example of the magic literalism that I was talking about in the intro, and it's certainly not the last time it will be used in the series. You're gonna get tired of me talking about it. Ida gets her wish of anonymity in King's body. King gets his wish of fitting in as someone taken seriously and not just loved for his cuddly wuddlies. And Luz gets her wish to be able to inherently use magic. But, of course, the monkey's paw curls, and it backfires on each of them. Yes, Ida gets to experience life without fear of capture, right up until she gets captured anyway for being so darn cute. The couple that gets her are uncomfortably reminiscent of that one couple from Running Scared. If you know, then you know. Ma'am, if you don't leave right now, I'm calling the police. Call him! Sure, Luz gets to live her dream of being a badass witch, but she had underestimated the constant pressure of being hunted by the law. Lilith captures her, and this is when we learn that her ultimate goal is to get Ida to join the Emperor's Coven, basically clipping her metaphorical wings. And King? Well, I mean, he gets captured too? Not really sure what the lesson he was supposed to learn here was, to be honest. Um, even non-fluffy people can be dismissed or patronized? I don't know, let's move on. Episode 9 is a Gus-centric episode, and really the first that deeply explores characters outside the main three. He lies to Luz to get her to attend his human fan club meeting at Hexide, as a way to gain clout and show up his rival. It's not that Gus is a bad person, he just really wants to be seen as cool and to be known for something other than his illusion magic, which we learn is looked down upon as the weakest form of magic on the Boiling Isles. He grows from the episode, no longer using his friends, though his insecurity still lingers. My dude, me too! In the B-plot of the episode, we learn that Ida herself went to Hexide and was just as anti-authoritarian back then as she is now. In the episode, she shows that she doesn't actually feel bemused ambivalence towards Luz, but truly cares for her as she practically begs the headmaster to remove the ban from episode 3 and allow her to enroll in classes. In episode 10, Luz learns the hard lesson of having empathy for even the non-humanoid creatures of the Boiling Isles and to not take them for granted. When Ida is away, Luz takes Albert, the palisman, for a bit of a joyride on the way to a grudge me match. However, due to her carelessness, she winds up injuring him. So I guess I should explain the palisman. Palace mans? They basically are the same as a witch's familiar, but they also operate as a flying broom and can go inanimate for a while. Despite that, though, they are sentient creatures like many of the other non-humanoid creatures of the Isles. The Bat Queen, introduced a few episodes back, takes the cracked Albert under her wing, both literally and figuratively, and refuses to let Luz have him back unless she passes three trials. There's a bit of an Island of Misfit Toys dynamic going on here. No child wants to play with a Charlie in the box. And it's revealed that the Bat Queen herself was once a neglected palisman. Hence why she's taking in strays, and why she takes Luz's carelessness so seriously. Probably the biggest development from the episode, though, is that Ida, who has been having trouble sourcing her potion in recent episodes, realizes that it's no longer as effective as it once was. The curse is beginning to turn the stalemate. Episode 11 gives us some more interaction between Ida and Lilith, alone. Their relationship is very much relatable, especially in this first season. They have a clear rivalry, dating back to their childhoods. They goad, one-up, and generally screw with each other, you know, just like real siblings. But also, deep down, they care for one another, and it shows. In the story, Ida finds out about a magical MacGuffin that Lilith wants and tries to beat her to it. Of course, bickering ensues when they are brought together, though what I want to point out is how, when an external threat comes between them, they drop all infighting and defend one another. It's also the very first King-heavy episode. If it's disappointing in any way, I will spend every day of my life trashing it! 
As always, King's ambition leads him astray, willing to do anything to gain the fame and respect that he believes he deserves. First, he screws over Luz by taking her concept for a book, a project that was supposed to be collaborative. He takes it a step further and makes a Faustian bargain, the first of the series, but not the last, to become a famous author, which, of course, backfires as Faustian bargains are wont to do. In the end, he's forced to realize the part that Luz played in his success, and that no matter how important he thinks he is, he would be nothing without her. Honestly, the plot feels a little bit personal and makes me wonder if something similar happened to Dana Terrace at some point. That's a toxic mentality that contributes to burnout and unrealistic expectations. You know, minus the lizard devil stand-in. The conflict is even resolved by the Barbara Streisand creature. I'm sorry, I just can't see her as anything other than that. And she is voiced by Dana Terrace herself, getting the successful book deal that King so craved. Episode 12 is the first time we see Amity and Luz approximating a healthy friendship, or at least a not-quite-so-toxic one. Amity informs Luz that she must learn at least two spells to get in the same class as her. So, Luz sets out with Ida to try finding another glyph, only to find Amity and her siblings at the training spot as well. Hijinks ensue when Luz secretly takes Amity's training wand out of frustration, inadvertently awakening a Slither Beast, which promptly captures all but the two girls. So, once again, they are forced to work together, just like in the library. Honestly, I don't have much more to say about this episode, as it does have such similar plot beats as the library episode. However, there are a couple pretty big developments that tie back to the overarching story of the season. First of all, Luz learns her second spell, realizing that the glyphs she's been using are tied to the island and its intrinsic, elemental magic. I really like this idea of her being a fish out of water and needing to teach herself everything. It's a great vessel for character growth and for her to display her ingenuity, which is one of her biggest strengths. Secondly, since she learned the new spell, Luz is able to join the same class as Amity and the others. Next is episode 13, where a whole hell of a lot happens. Barkus says your aura is strong and silly, like a baby's laughter. I still wasn't fully invested at this point in my first watch, though in my second, I was able to appreciate the implications it has to the greater story. Luz finally learns the true nature of Covens when she begins classes at Hexside, and is understandably upset when she is forced to pick one magic track, as decreed by the Emperor for all witches except his personal coven. Once the student picks a branch of magic and graduates, they're given a tattoo on their wrist that forcibly prevents them from practicing any other types. Not only would this limit Luz's abilities, metaphorically her ability to express herself, but it wouldn't even make sense seeing as she uses a completely different type of magic. This is one of the main conflicts in the show, the inciting issue. Up to now, it's never been really questioned. Everybody, all the witches and students, just accept this as normal because it's been that way for so long. Basically, the Overton window has shifted. In the same way, the show has made it seem normal to us, the viewer. We, or at least I, never ask why, until now when the audience insert comes face to face with the choice. Of course, Luz, like Ida before her, refuses to choose, and she learns the hard way that questioning this system only gets her shut away, her magic privileges removed. However, she also learns that there are still people willing to rebel against that. Her companions in detention have a way of learning whatever magic they want, and that's a great lesson. No matter how authoritarian the state, and no matter how much the general public are complicit in perpetuating injustices, there are always people that want to teach themselves how to make things better. Also, the climax of the episode introduces us to a basilisk, a type of creature that steals magic. And it's the fact that the creature was stopped only with the use of multiple types of magic that finally convinces the headmaster of the school to ignore the emperor's order and allow students to study more than one type. After the more plot-forward story that we just saw, episode 14 returns back to the slice-of-life fair and, other than exploring more the relationship between Luz and King especially, doesn't have much of consequence for the story going forward. However, it is nice to see that King is finally willing to admit that he wants to spend time with Luz as they go to the carnival together. He's becoming more attached to her, something he has probably been avoiding due to his abandonment issues, which we will explore later. One thing that is pretty odd is that up to now, we haven't had much mention of Luz's mom. It's been at least multiple weeks since she came into the demon realm, and we know her phone works, so why have we not seen any messages from her or any sense of guilt or homesickness from Luz? Doesn't really involve this episode, 
So instead of focusing on that, we'll move on to 15. This is probably the single most important episode in terms of adding character depth to Willow and Amity and their growing friendship with Luz. It's also another great example of the magic literalism concept. Luz finds a picture of Willow and Amity together as young children, and wanting to cover this up, Willow sets the photo on fire. However, these aren't normal photos. They contain actual memories, and when the fire begins to spread, Willow loses more and more of her memories. So Luz and Amity take her to Ida, who, in turn, sends them directly into Willow's mind. In a more realistic style of fiction, this kind of character study would have been shown through dialogue, or perhaps something like a flashback. However, a fantasy show such as The Owl House allows for this more literal delving into the character's mind, which in turn makes it more dynamic and powerful for the audience as well. The entire season we've been circling around Amity becoming a good person and friend to the others. This episode is another step towards that, easily the biggest so far. It's revealed that as children, Amity's mom, Mrs. Blight, gave her daughter an ominous ultimatum. Abandon Willow as a friend, or she would remove the unworthy witchlet herself. It's not stated exactly what Mrs. Blight meant by this, and of course we never learn since Amity chose to spare her friend her mother's wrath, but seeing what she was willing to do in a similar situation with Luce, it's not hard to imagine the lengths that Mrs. Blight would go to in the name of reputation. Regardless, Amity didn't discard Willow out of cruelty, but because she really cared for her friend. Trying to please such a power-hungry woman so focused on her own ambition is a Sisyphean task. Just avoiding her anger was hard enough, and walking that tightrope had warped Amity's own morals, slowly turning her into a mini version of her mother, right down to her green hair. It's also certainly what caused her to be, at the same time, a perfectionist, yet constantly doubting herself, afraid of slipping even for a moment. It's a sign of trauma. And it's only delving into her friend's mind, literally, seeing the hurt that she caused Willow that she finally softens and admits to her long-kept secret. It's also this episode where we see the first real signs that Amity caught feelings for Luce, leading to a will-they-won't-they they while they constantly blush at one another. Seriously, there is so much blushing. Episode 16 takes these, uh, subtle? Let's go with subtle feelings that Amity has for Luz and makes them very much explicit. Since the last episode, it seems like Amity has let her guard down enough to let Luz and the others into her life. Luz learns her third spell and finally hears from her mom about goddamn time. Clearly, she has been feeling some anxiety about speaking to her mom again after how things were left, explaining one side of the lack of communication at least. Again, from Luz's perspective, Camilla tried to force her to change to make the people around her more comfortable, rather than making Luz more comfortable with herself. We see Hexide's version of Prom, called uh, Grom, only it isn't a normal dance. Instead, the Grom Queen has to fight a monster that embodies the fear of anyone it gets near, called Grometheus the Fearbringer, a play on words of the Greek titan Prometheus the Firebringer. Amity is chosen as queen, but is apprehensive of her fears being exposed, so Luz volunteers as tribute. However, things go awry and Amity has to step in. Again, they have to work together to resolve the conflict. Amity throwing away her concerns to stand up for Luz against Grom Camilla can easily be interpreted as a metaphor for a queer partner standing up to an unaccepting parent. Though, for the real Camilla, this actually isn't the case. Either way, they prevail over the monster, showing that not only do they work well as a team, but they can make beautiful magic together. At this point, it seems like Luz still only views Amity as a friend, and doesn't yet reciprocate the romantic feelings. In fact, the only romantic interest we've seen thus far for Luz was a very brief line about a shirtless dude in the second episode. Do you need a cape? Nah, I think you I'm You can good. use my shirt! Yes? I need a cape! Again, the monster, Grometheus, is a literal way for the writers to show the links that the two of them will go for each other, that they will literally face their fears for one another, even when they have fears about revealing said fears. Am I saying fears a lot? I, I feel like I'm saying fears a lot. Fears. Amity's being Luz rejecting her, and Luz's being her mom finding out that she never went to camp and rejecting her as a witch. Although, personally, I think her fake jokey fears were even worse. Luz, help me help! Human souls trapped no, in cat bodies! I don't want to be this! Maybe that's just me. Episode 17 is the last Slice of Life episode before shit hits the fan. It's another Willow-heavy episode. Luz pulls a, 
Well, my dad can beat up your dad. And Willow winds up in a grudgeby match against Basha. If it wasn't already obvious that the game is a critique of Quidditch, it definitely is this episode. Amity and Willow have both grown since the beginning of the season, and especially since the memory episode. For her part, Willow is really starting to become the confident, badass plant witch that we saw sparks of early on. Amity, on the other hand, isn't nearly as uptight and self-righteous as she was at the beginning. A lot of these developments are direct results of their friendship with Luz, and the grudgeby match just cements Amity's inclusion into the group. And boy, does Amity have it bad for her. Me? On a team with you? <laughs> Running around in cute uniforms? <laughs> Sweating? I gotta go! So, up to now, things have been only lightly serialized. There's been a continuity, of course, but not so much in terms of a large story arc, outside of a few developments here and there. That changes in episode 18. Throughout the season, there have been a few encounters between Ida and Lilith, and each time the younger sister warns that one day she will arrest the older, and that day has come. This was the episode that slapped me around and made me pay attention. After this, I was fully invested in the show. Hexide goes on a field trip to tour the Emperor's palace and meet his coven, run-of-the-mill state propaganda to indoctrinate the children, putting them in awe of the coven system. I just want to state here that up until this episode, we've not been introduced to the Emperor. We haven't even seen or heard him, instead only ever coming in contact with his minions. When he is finally revealed, he looks like some otherworldly demon. We don't learn much about him, outside the fact that he uses some sort of strange eye drops, and his throne sits in front of the beating heart of a titan, somehow preserved. Also, that he has been pressuring Lilith to capture Ida, promising her that he would heal her once she joins the coven. However, Ida has not been doing too hot since discovering that the elixir's effect was weakening. Luz has noticed this and decided to use the field trip as a cover to find a relic that can cure Ida of the curse. The episode starts off like any other, a very light-hearted heist montage, complete with silly music and sound effects. Even with such serious stakes, but it takes a drastic turn when Lilith catches Luz trying to rob the Emperor and quickly realizes that she can use the girl to force Ida into submission. Ida fights Lilith to save Luz, as the younger sister stooped to threatening the girl's life. In doing this, Lilith crossed a line, causing Ida to abandon all reservations about fighting her sister and to go all out. And seeing her let loose is awesome. She's kind of a badass. But then how pathetic are you? that you can't best me at my worst. With this sudden tone shift, the lighting shifts as well, and the music swells to match it. Instead of the mostly even lighting the show has used up to now, which gives the vibes of innocence or naivety, it changes to darker hues with harsh shadows obscuring the faces of the characters, reflecting the dark emotion of the scene. All signs pointing to a deadly serious conflict, something this show has avoided up to this point. In general, the show has a very cutesy aesthetic, which is kind of weird when paired with the bizarre and unnatural demons and vistas, but the contrast works. However, this battle scene takes the animation up multiple notches, with some quick, fluid movements and interesting perspective changes that make the action feel more dynamic and impactful. Ida is defeated when Luz gets thrown off the bridge. She chooses to save the girl rather than finishing off her sister. The Emperor gets his desire, as though Luz escapes Ida is captured. We finally find out that the shadowy figure responsible for the curse that we have been seeing in flashbacks was Lilith all along. She was jealous of her sister being such a naturally gifted witch, so she sabotaged her tryout for the Emperor's Coven when they were kids. The final credit scene forced us to stew in this dark ending, the normal version with Luz walking through the boiling aisles set to a jaunty tune is replaced with a totally silent pan of the Emperor's castle. This was the exact moment in my first watch that I knew I needed to talk about this show. Episode 19 picks up right where the previous one ended, the first major serialization we've seen up to this point. Immediately, Emperor Bellos' power is revealed. After so long with so little information about him, the seal has been broken. I want to highlight his entrance into the room, as only his eyes are visible at first, the rest of him cast in darkness. It places an emphasis on their electric, glowing blue color as something alien, something we haven't seen in any of the other creatures on the Isles. 
His display of power is also unprecedented, as he effortlessly restrains Ida, even in her cursed owl beast form. From this one action, it's immediately understandable, without any dialogue, why he is so feared and how he was able to become emperor in the first place. But it's more than just his magic. Anytime he's shown next to the other characters, the perspective makes him look as though he towers over them, leering, looming. In this episode, we're shown visibly his superiority over Lilith, specifically, who we know to be about on par with Ida, not so subtly showing us how much more powerful the Emperor is than anything we've seen thus far. So, a couple episodes ago, I discussed some of the character growth we've seen, but there was a glaring exception. Luz, you know, the protagonist. That's because, up until this episode, she hadn't experienced much growth. Episode 1 and Episode 18 Luz are practically identical, yet seeing Ida succumb to the curse and her subsequent capture have clearly changed Luz, as losing a loved one changes all of us. In the space of one episode, she is toughened, more serious. We see her smash an orb and rage, an emotion she has never come close to expressing up to this point. Her anger towards Lilith specifically stands out in stark contrast to her character in the rest of the season. This kind, curious, and honestly innocent girl. I just want to talk. Talk to the glyph, witch! Chekhov's conformatorium, introduced all the way back in the first episode, is finally paid off, as Ida gets locked up and scheduled to be turned to stone. All for the audacity to practice more than one type of magic. How awful of her. Meanwhile, Luz hatches a plan to get her out, and is successful in breaking into the conformatorium. There, she faces off against Belos for the first time. She even scores a hit on the Emperor, proving that he isn't some invincible monster, though he is still clearly the more powerful witch. It's revealed that he has ulterior motives for wanting Ida, the portal door she possesses. So, as that's the only advantage Luz has, she destroys the door, and in doing so, her only means of returning home. Ultimately, she's successful in saving Ida, and Lilith, finally seeing the error of her ways, takes some of the curse from her sister to bring her back to consciousness, at least. However, it seems breaking the door finally made things real for Luz in a way that they weren't before. She's met friends and gone on wonderful, exciting adventures in the demon realm, but in the end, she was just running from her problems back home. In the final shot, we see that the Emperor is attempting to repair the destroyed portal door, setting up the story arc for the rest of the show. This is no longer the fun, happy-go-lucky world that we were introduced to. While there will still be jokes and fun in the second season, this constant ticking clock and threat of violence is revealed to have been just underneath the surface the entire time, and it rears its head even more often next season. Overall, Season 1 spends its runtime effectively setting up the world and characters so that by the end, we are fully invested in these weirdos and their struggle against the Emperor, the budding romance between Luz and Amity, all of it. My one complaint is that god damn did it take a while to get there. Despite that, I still stand by my opinion that a lot of this context is necessary. Just look at David Ayer's failed Suicide Squad attempt, or pretty much any of the older DC Universe for that matter, to see why taking time for world building and establishing relationships is so essential for the audience to buy into the story. Had we been thrown into the plot at the beginning without knowing anything about anything, it wouldn't have worked. I just wish that some of the fat had been trimmed off, says the guy making a two hour long analysis. I don't know. Maybe that's just my jaded adult opinion. I could imagine that for a kid, these fun, lighthearted episodes would be nice and familiar. And then, wham! Right at the end, it kicks the children right in the feels. And I'm all for kicking children in the feels. One thing I haven't really touched on is the fact that this show seems like it was written to be memed on. No, I'm talking about hot goss, girl. Hot goss buns, bread bun. There are a bunch of really good one-liners that are even given space to be clipped. Really helps for my job. You bring the razzle, I'll bring the dazzle. Do you always have confetti on you, or...? Now, before we move on to Season 2, I wanted to talk about some of the fan-made media surrounding the show. In particular, there are a ton of very professional-looking fan comics that either flesh out more of the storyline or look into the future. Take Reddit user MacMark, who has, at the time of writing, an ongoing 16-issue series called Grom Factor, as well as other smaller series and one-offs. 
in which Luz and Amity continued their relationship, becoming explorers and inventors, and just generally larger-than-life individuals. They also, somewhere along the line, somehow, had a daughter, AZ, who is now attending Hexide like them, and she tries to step out from under her mother's looming shadows to create a name for herself. If you're a fan of fan comics, or just of comics in general, and you enjoyed The Owl House, you will enjoy these. Regardless, with everything being well established in the first season, the second season moves at a much quicker pace, despite being even longer. There are way fewer of the Slice of Life episodes, as even ones that don't directly serve the plot to take down Bellows, do develop characters in a way that indirectly does so. Every single one of them serves a purpose in furthering the main story. In particular, King gets quite a bit more development than the first season, and said development winds up saving the rest of the cast at the end. Or Lilith and Hootie, who both feel inadequate and unloved, and bond over the course of the season, making the former a reformed villain, and the latter more than a one-note comedic relief character. It kind of makes me wonder if Dana Terrace had a suspicion that the show was being cancelled during the writing process, as the pace between seasons is so drastically different. She made a post explaining the cancellation, which we'll discuss later, but it was dated October of 2021, just prior to when the second half of season 2 aired. I would imagine that she had heard things through the grapevine and possibly altered the trajectory of the show to ensure their story was told, but that's just my speculation conspiracy theory. Even still, despite having an already deep cast of characters, the list isn't stagnant either. In fact, season 2 introduces many of the most beloved characters, such as Hunter, Rain, and Darius, and never forget Steve. The second season begins about a week after the season 1 finale. Not much time has passed, yet the status quo has been majorly changed. Both Ida and Lilith are without magic since the younger sister absorbed half the curse. Even before it's discussed, the development is indicated by each of them now having a single grey eye, as well as Lilith's shirt featuring a dead battery. That's rough, buddy. This makes Luz the primary breadwinner of the Owl House by taking bounties in Bonesboro, meaning she had to grow up quickly. We saw some of this when Ida was taken at the end of last season, and that seriousness in her character is still there. Meanwhile, Bellos has graduated to straight-up propaganda posters, Lilith has left the Emperor's Coven and now she and the entire household are fugitives from the law, and Gus is going through witch puberty. Big important changes all around. Since the fight with the Emperor, Luz has improved her magical skills, yet despite this and the responsibility that the two older witches have placed on her shoulders, they still, rightly in my opinion, only allow her to take on low-risk, low-reward bounties. She is only 14 after all. Luz, being Luz, decides to hell with that and takes on a much bigger one instead. It's here that we are first introduced to the Golden Guard, Hunter. He is immediately set up as a new secondary antagonist of the show, replacing Lilith. From a practical standpoint, the Golden Guard allows the Emperor to still operate indirectly, thus allowing the mystery surrounding his identity and the suspense for the inevitable showdown to grow. Fun, unrelated fact, the Selkie Gris that the bounty asked for is a reference to the real-world substance called Ambergris, which is basically like poop lube naturally produced by whales and is extremely valuable as it's used in basically all high-end perfumes and colognes. So now that's a thing you know. Oh, also Hootie and Lilith became friends. In episode 2, we finally meet Amity's mother and father. Though we have seen them previously in Willow's memories, witnessing the dynamic between them here makes it crystal clear why Amity turned out the way she did. Mrs. Blight is proud, ambitious, and ruthless, while Mr. Blight is just the stereotypical head-in-the-clouds scientist that just can't be bothered to act like a father. Their interests align in that while Daddy just wants to make cool shit, Magical Dommy Mommy wants to use cool shit to gain power. Parenting is a distant second priority. Mrs. Blight gets Luz and the others, except Amity of course, expelled from Hexide because she doesn't approve of them as friends. However, the Blights agree to have them reinstated if Luz helps them test their new invention, something they would usually have Amity be their guinea pig for to show off for investors, but this time Luz takes her place. Again, this is a sort of magic literalism, as Luz testing the Abomatron in place of Amity shows how much she cares for her, 
On the flip side, when it looks like the robot is going to maim or even kill Luz, Amity goes Gohan mode and unleashes her rage, defying her parents to save her friend. It's this act that finally causes Luz to see Amity in a new light, quite literally with this badass looking back moment where her face is cast in a cool shadow, but also as something other than a friend, again with the blushing. In the B-plot, given the situation with Ida and Lilith's magic, Luz agreed to teach them how to use glyphs. The student has now become the teacher, and in doing so we learn a little bit more about the two witches. Lilith is a teacher's pet, wanting to do anything to make Luz approve of her. Meanwhile, Ida is more of the rebel, as we already knew, but in this case it translates to her improvising and trying to combine glyphs to create new spells. While this improvisation served her well with the magic she was used to, Lilith's approach bears more fruit here. Oh, how the turns have tabled in Episode 3. Early in the series, Luz was so worried that she was never going to become a witch like Ida. Now their places have completely swapped. Ida is still struggling to learn this new form of magic, while Luz is figuring out things like how to combine glyphs, which allow for more complex and varied spells the first of which being an invisibility glyph. After 22 episodes, we're finally getting some more info on King's backstory. Up to now, his identity has been a complete mystery, and though his claim that he was king of the demons was mostly unbelievable, it was never a sure thing. In the episode, he takes Luz, Lilith, and Ida to the island where Ida found him as an infant. There, they find crumbling ruins with enigmatic carvings and an unstoppable guardian automaton. In the top chamber of the ruins, King finds the shell that he emerged from, finally remembering details from his birth, a skill that I am thankful not to have. He remembers his father was present at one point, but then left. He remembers that he had the run of the ruined castle, save for the Guardian, and that his ideas of being the Demon King stemmed from childhood games that he played to keep himself occupied. It's a pretty devastating thing to learn about yourself. He'd clearly been repressing the memory because it was so traumatic. It's why he's so strongly bonded to Ida. She was the one to find him on the island, so small and alone, the first conscious being he had ever met. It's also why he's been so desperate to gain notoriety. His rough, lonely childhood is being overcorrected to where he feels the need to have everyone love and admire him. In episode 4, we're finally introduced to Ida's mother, Gwendolyn. What? Suddenly curious about my past? Always, always curious. As she visits the Owl House with a supposed cure to the curse. Again, we see the dichotomy between the two sisters. Ida immediately tries to send Gwen away, feeling smothered by her attention and fed up with the countless futile attempts to cure her curse. In contrast, Lilith has always felt neglected like the forgotten child, and so is desperate for the attention that her sister so casually throws away. This is just a little too real, and often happens with siblings, especially when one has a chronic illness. By sheer virtue of the afflicted child requiring more attention due to their illness, much of the time the other children would normally have with their parents is sapped away. We've already discussed how Ida's curse is an allegory for real-world diseases like AIDS, and just like in the real world, there are people willing to throw anything and everything at the wall to see what sticks, no matter how dubious. This is exactly what Granny Clawthorn does. She takes away Ida's potions, the one thing that has been effective at managing her curse, all because some shady book sold by an even shadier healer told her to. Meanwhile, Ida is blissfully unaware of what's happening, and she, well. Oh, baby. Time to stock up on Mama's night juice. I promise that's not sexual in context, but I also refuse to provide the context. Eventually, though, a flare-up occurs, and of course, Gwen's homeopathic treatments do nothing to stem the transformation. She finally figures out that she's been scammed and gives her daughter the medicine she needs. I like that the episode doesn't frame the mom as a bad person, per se. She was just someone desperate to heal her daughter and would try anything to do it. What's sad is that there are plenty of grifters out there eager to take advantage of such desperate people. At the end of the episode, we get a huge clue on how Luz might return home, when Gwen unveils the dual secrets of Titan's blood and that it contains enormous power, and that Luz is not the only human to have visited the Boiling Isles contrary to what we've been told up to now. 
The last shot goes back to the human realm, showing us Camilla and some sort of doppelganger impersonating Luz. Episode 5 is one of the closest we get to Slice of Life episodes of early Season 1, and I'm all here for it because we finally get some serious development of Gus's character. Yet even here, the main arc is being driven forward in the B-plot, where Amity lets Luz into the forbidden section of the library. Again, I swear that's not an innuendo, just because I read it in a sultry voice. <clears throat> uh, to find Philip Wittebane's diary, the human that Gwendolyn mentioned in the previous episode. But of course, they're caught by the library guardian and get in, like, massive trouble. I'm just, like, super disappointed in you. Like, I can't even process these feelings right now. Luz sticks up for Amity and gets a kiss on the cheek for her efforts. Again, so, so much blushing this episode. Anyways, back to the main plot. Gus is having an early onset midlife crisis as he still has deeply rooted insecurities about practicing illusion magic. He's introduced to this team of witchlit students from a neighboring school who have an over the top entrance. Good work, guys! Yeah. All right. All right, yeah. <gasps> they tell him of these MacGuffins that will enhance the power of yada yada yada, and so he joins them in their search. Martholomew, winner of Dumbest Name in the Series Award and Bully of Gus in the first season, is part of the group as well and gives Gus shit for his magic. So Luz gives him some glyphs to look cool in front of the others. However, once arriving at the Magic Stone's resting place, Gus realizes that it's an illusionist temple and that they're being guarded as their power is too dangerous. The other students reveal themselves to be ruthless grave robbers. Gus turns the entire field into an illusion, proving that A, illusion magic is not weak at all, contrary to the stigma surrounding it, and B, he is an especially strong practitioner of it. Ultimately, Gus learns that power for power's sake can be a very dangerous thing, a lesson that will become very relevant with Belos. In episode 6, we gain some insight into the Emperor's plans. He is dead set on getting rid of what he calls wild magic which is an arbitrary distinction that he created for witches that don't limit themselves to one particular branch, ignoring his edict. There are plenty of different readings of this depending on the lens that you're viewing it through, such as wanting to get rid of the ability for one to express their sexual orientation, or gender identity, or any other myriad ways. He has created this societal norm that everyone follows because of lies told to them since birth, limiting themselves because Homie is a witch racist. While Bellos himself is still ridiculously powerful, the crack in his mask that Luz created in their confrontation is growing, symbolizing his facade of control and absolute power cracking, which we will see through more as the season progresses. At Hexide, the students take part in the Palisman Selection Ceremony, where they adopt little buddies rescued by the Bat Queen. The ceremony exemplifies exactly what the Emperor hates about magic, that the Palisman's selection is based on the witch's personality and isn't something that can be gamed or influenced. Belos wants to have absolute control over magic, but magic is, by its very nature, wild and unpredictable, and so is the ceremony. In an attempt to please Belos, the Golden Guard hunter steals the Palisman from the school, but Luz manages to thwart his plans. Meanwhile, Kikimora, a character who we've yet to talk about, has cooked up her own scheme to steal the Palisman for herself and discard the Golden Guard to elevate her own status. Her betrayal forces Luz and Hunter to team up in a story reminiscent of Luz and Amity's multiple instances of doing so in Season 1. There's this really strong messaging in the show about allowing oneself to trust others, even or especially in situations where that's not easy. This will become important later on when we learn more about Belos. This episode is an important one for the series, as it better fleshes out the character of Hunter, showing hints that he isn't just some tool for the Emperor. He has thoughts and feelings of his own, and merely has misplaced loyalty towards his father figure. He's even given some comedic lines, which doesn't really happen for true villains in the series, like Belos. How do I land this thing? Hmm. Oh, you just pull that cord above your head. Oh, thank you. Hi. Luz has to confront the fact that she has no plan. Her conflict with the Golden Guard in this episode is emblematic of the larger conflict within herself. She just wanted an adventure, but what does she want greater than that? Why is she a part of this fight that really has nothing to do with her? You don't tend to think things through, do you, human? The two briefly bond over the fact that neither of them can inherently cast magic, yet have found ways to do so anyway. 
Luz with her glyphs, and Hunter with his staff. Together, they put Kikimura's freaky finger dragon to sleep. This creature is awful, and I love it. Though I've been calling him Hunter in this video, at this point in the story, we don't actually know his true name. Yet, that changes at the end of the episode, when he gains some level of trust and respect for Luz, and decides to share it with her. Luz decides to hold off on picking a palisman, because she wants to think such an important decision through, for once. At the end of the episode, we see that one of the palismen, Flapjack, has chosen Hunter to be its witch. This ties into the idea of the importance of trust that I discussed earlier in the episode. Taking in Flapjack goes against everything that the Emperor preaches, yet Hunter does it anyway. He chooses to trust the little guy, and later on when Hunter begins to question things, Flapjack's friendship is the one constant that he has. Episode 7 introduces us to Rain Whispers, the show's first non-binary character, and they're cool as shit. Blasphemy! Blasphem you! See? You're a natural! I want to say again that it's nice that while this universe does have its own prejudices, they aren't the homophobic, transphobic, or racist ones that we're used to. On the Boiling Isles, being non-binary is just about as notable as someone hating Season 8 of Game of Thrones, in that it isn't notable at all. So what you're whinging about? I'm not whinging! Your lips are moving and you're complaining about something. That's whinging. Even the villains use the proper pronouns. Now, we don't know too much about Rain yet, except that they have a strong sense of justice and style, but we'll get more info as the season progresses. Anyway, Rain and Ida were friends and even possibly romantically involved prior to the events of the show, though they hadn't seen each other in years. Ida finds them protecting witches from the Emperor's cronies and follows them back to their group hideout. There, they explain that they're a rebel group, opposed to Bellows' subjugation of covenless, so-called wild witches. And they call themselves... The Bards Against the Throne, a.k.a. The Bats! Ida joins up with them, eager to make something of herself, probably as she has felt useless since losing her magic. They talk about the past, and Ida even plays a song for them called Rain's Rhapsody. And because my own commentary just wouldn't be as good here, I'm going to quote Reddit user Angel's Egg speaking about the song. When we first hear the song, the chords underneath the melody are all major, G. But by the end of the episode, the arrangement has entirely switched to the relative minor, E minor. This can symbolize a lot of different things. Hope versus nostalgia, love versus loss, etc. But I think it's particularly brilliant how it switches during certain scenes to highlight those contrasts. Another shift it indicates is Ida's own attitude towards her life and the things she has endured. At the beginning of the episode, she keeps trying to recreate the tune as she remembered it, and keeps cutting it off as soon as it starts to turn minor, as the curse manifests. But by the end, she starts the tune in minor, showing that she is ready to confront her trauma and loss. I don't think it's an accident that this is the episode right before she integrates the curse into her harpy form. In addition, the song causes objects around Ida to float and then wither and crumble away. This seems to be a result of Ida's advanced curse, or perhaps her relation to it, as when we see flashbacks of her playing the same song, the decaying effect doesn't happen. Seems like this also may be the same metaphor expressed in a different way. However, the heartwarming reunion is cut short when their mission turns out to be an ambush by two of the other coven heads, and Rain gets captured. So, I guess I should explain that concept. As we know, Bellows created the different covens, each dedicated to a particular branch of magic. The coven heads are representatives of these branches who each report to Bellows directly. Rain is the head of the bard coven and can do some seriously wicked music magic, while the ones that captured him are Darius of the Abomination coven and uh, this cat thing of the Beast coven. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, Luz and King are competing in a race, and Ida is able to barely make it back to them in time to see them finish. Once, she had found family in Rain, and she now has another in Luz and King. In fact, King reveals that he had changed his name to King Clawthorn to make it official. It's a sweet ending to a bittersweet episode overall. Finally, finally, after all this time in Episode 8, we get some hot hootie action. Not like that. The entire house is feeling down, so Hootie takes it upon himself to cheer them up. He's not really successful in anything he sets out to do, yet his incompetence actually ends up helping his friends in unintended ways. King's story has always been trying to figure out who he is and how he fits into the world. 
Since revisiting his birthplace, his growth has accelerated, and those questions are only getting more intense. Part of the struggle is that his father wasn't there to teach him how to be a Titan. He had no examples on what this growth should look like, at least not from his own species. This clearly affected him more than he lets on, and when he finally admits that this episode, his latent power and anger are unleashed. Ida is forced to confront her trauma via a hallucination, and realize that while she's always blamed the Owl Beast for everything, she herself pushed people away before they had a chance to accept her, curse and all. In reality, she was the one who couldn't accept herself. We see the Owl Beast tied to her like a leash, and no matter what she tries to rid herself of it, nothing works. For better or worse, she is stuck with the curse. I did not intend for that to rhyme, but she has to learn to live in harmony with it. And by the end of her story, she does, successfully merging with it and becoming Harpy Ida. Ascended Owl Ida. Final form Owl Ida. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. Finally, Luz has been wanting to date Amity, but hasn't had the courage to pop the question. Maybe you can tell me how to ask out a cotton candy haired goddess? So, Hootie takes it upon himself to get the ball rolling by kidnapping Amity and putting them both in a tunnel of love. That sounded a lot more creepy reading it out loud. Yet despite the absolute slam dunk in front of her, Luz can't read the room. Amity is so into her that she actually likes the gesture, no matter how cheesy it is right up until Luz starts sabotaging it and breaking things. Eventually, through sheer incompetence, Hootie is successful, not in the tunnel of love, but because he goes insane and inadvertently forces Luz and Amity to admit their feelings to one another. At the end, Hootie meets a stranger that looks an awful lot like King, who gives him a letter for King. But, I mean, it's still Hootie, so... Oh my gosh, a bug! <laughs> Episode 9 begins with one of Emperor Bellos's failed attempts to open his cobbled together portal door. The key meant to unlock it crumbles and disappears as it's missing a key ingredient, Titan's blood. For the first time, we see Bellos's face behind the mask. It's marred by a green, almost plant-like lesion. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice that while his ears are pointed, they are much smaller than most witches, almost like a human had cut their ears into shape, almost. Meanwhile, Luz is incapacitated with some unknown illness. A little worrying that demon realm diseases have evolved to infect humans, but I digress. While she's laid up in bed, the others all race off to Eclipse Lake, where they supposedly find the Titan's blood needed to make a new portal door. Both Hunter and Kikimura separately head to the lake as well, and they come into conflict with our heroes. Eventually, Amity and Hunter are alone, well, except for King, in the chamber where Titan's blood is supposedly found. They don't realize it yet, but there's actually another source standing right next to them. Regardless, Hunter plays into Amity's own fears about her relationship with Luz and causes her to doubt herself. However, King helps her realize that she was just being paranoid. Amity follows by pretty succinctly summing up the trauma that she and Hunter both share. I grew up thinking that everything was an opportunity to justify existing. They both realize that the Titan's blood said to be within the cave was a red herring but at the same time that the portal door key that Amity has contains a small amount of the substance. The struggle that ensues is pretty freaking epic. The animation, just like in episode 18 of last season, is well done. The movement is so fluid, feeling like a high-budget anime rather than a Disney cartoon. Eventually, Amity wins by cleverly breaking the key and absorbing some of the blood in her glove. It's a move we'd expect Luz to make, and kind of shows how their relationship has positively affected her. Now, armed with the Titan blood from the key, and the knowledge that she's been accumulating over the last few episodes, Luce is finally able to put together a makeshift portal in episode 10. Unfortunately, the portal does not take her back to the human realm. Instead, she winds up in this liminal space between worlds, filled with cubes that correspond to different people in both realms, and that allow for observation and even communication. The episode begins in media res with the imposter fully taking on the role of Camille's daughter, when Luz, looking through a cube, catches her. Turns out, the imposter has a name, V, and is actually a basilisk. Remember them from season one? She was actually one of the prisoners that Luz saved from the conformatorium all the way back in episode one. Luz is forced to be an observer for the entire episode, unable to interact physically. However, she does realize that having V there in her place would allow her to continue the fight on the Boiling Isles without Camilla worrying. 
Only problem is that to keep up the Luz disguise, V needs magic. The search for which makes real the fact that while Luz has been in the demon realm, her life has been going on without her. People that she was once intimidated by are now friends with the fake Luz, enough so to give her a tarot card reading. You're running from your past. The guilt and fear you carry will eventually catch you in a self-fulfilling prophecy. The funny thing is, the reading doesn't just describe V running away from persecution, it also perfectly describes Luz as well. Eventually, the search for magic leads V right into a trap with a wannabe witch hunter conspiracy theorist. And they're all sent from Mars to harvest human teeth to power their time machine! Luz tried in vain to keep her double life secret, but ultimately she's forced to come clean to Camilla to save V. It's her inability to allow people to get hurt, her compassion and sense of justice, exactly the character traits that Camilla installed in her. She makes contact with her mother, explaining everything, and Camilla ends up saving V. I'm the good guy here! Yeah, a lot of bad guys say that. At first, it seems like Camilla was taking everything exceedingly well. Weirdly well, in fact. However, once V is safe and back home, she breaks down. She was only holding it in while her children were in danger, for that's now how she views V. Because despite what we may have thought after the very first episode, she is a good mother. No, 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 no. When you come home, promise you'll stay here. I didn't mean to push you away. I swear things will be different. It's a terrible day for Rain. Episode 11 picks back up in the demon realm. Luz is wrestling with her promise to Camilla. She needs something to take her mind off the issue and just so happens to overhear Kikimura in the middle of a crisis, trying to decide whether to spend time with her family or attend the Coven Day Parade. Luz decides to intervene, though not exactly out of selflessness. She's projecting her own issues on Kikimura, attempting to fix her problems in lieu of dealing with her own. Meanwhile, Amity and Willow spend some quality time together. Not really relevant, but I mean, just look at the tippy taps. Since their capture, Rain has been held against their will. Their mind has been tampered with by the plant coven lady, Terra Snapdragon. Luz decides to help Kikimura get away from the Emperor's gaze by kidnapping her under the guise of helping Ida get back Rain. At first, Kikimura appears to be nothing more than a pawn, only working for Belos because she feels she has no other choice. We even begin to sympathize with her. However, her ambition gets the better of her as soon as an opportunity presents itself. Yet, while she pretends that she was playing the girls all along, I don't buy it. Once Ida gets Rain away from the parade, she tries to get them to come with her. However, they are pretty adamant that they're with the Emperor now. It appears the potion Terra has been feeding them has successfully turned them against Ida. At the same time though, Rain lets Ida get away without warning any of the Emperor's goons, indicating that the control isn't quite complete. Episode 12 is a very important one for the lore of the series. We get to see Philip Wittebane back when he created the original Portal Door, among other things. The episode intro has been replaced with notes from his journal, signaling this importance to the viewer. Luce has reached a bit of a dead end with Philip's diary, and just wishes there was a way to go back in time to speak to him. Ida comes to the rescue with a book full of deus ex machinas called History's Top Ten Plot Holes, a light lampshading of the time travel shenanigans that will occur. Luz learns of these time puddle things that act as a bridge between the past and the present, and together with Lilith, she manages to find one back to Philip's time. In the B-plot, Ida finally talks to her dad. Years ago, when she was first cursed, she accidentally hurt her father and still has not forgiven herself for it. She does everything she can to get out of the meeting. However, in the end, he shows himself to be a loving father, that he never held it against her, and the two reconcile. Both this and the main plot show the characters living in and being obsessed with the past and how ultimately it doesn't end up doing good things. Back in the past, Luz and Lilith find that this era of so-called wild magic is not what the Emperor led them to believe. Go figure. Instead, they find witches living in harmony. This may seem obvious at first, but remember that all the inhabitants of the island have been living under this lie for multiple generations. They don't have the detached outside perspective that we do. It really begs the question, what even is wild magic? It seems that the definition that separates the covens is fairly arbitrary. The idea of covens was, I believe, a completely human construction, almost like race in our world. The two meet Philip and decide to help him find some sort of artifact at the Titan's head, assuming that he needs it to make the portal. 
But he only let them think that. He is a textbook manipulator. The confidence, the compliments. He says everything you want to hear. It feels uncomfortably familiar. Power didn't corrupt him. Power just revealed what he truly was the entire time. Even early on in the episode, his prejudice is hinted at. The framing makes it appear that he's being bullied by a couple of demons, when in fact he's being interrogated for the disappearance of their brother, which he is most certainly responsible for. Luz and Lilith find out the hard way exactly who Philip is when he leads them into a beast's lair, as bait while grabbing the relic. They manage to escape by showing just a little compassion, something Philip would never have thought to do. Before leaving, though, Luz gives him a little piece of her mind, and Lilith a little piece of her fist. You, <laughs> you hateable sorceress! At the end of the episode, it's finally revealed that Philip is, in fact, the Emperor, if it wasn't already obvious. Note that Lilith's punch did not ignite the prejudice in Philip, though that's surely what he might say. The hate was already in him. The punch merely stoked the flame. In actuality, it wasn't some witch's wild magic that scarred him. It was his own greed and ambition that led him to eat Palisman and draw hex glyphs on his skin in a vain attempt to heal the wound from the punch that ultimately disfigured him. Now I'm only scarred emotionally. Also, Steve was here. Never forget Steve. Episodes 13 through 15 are some of the last slice of life episodes in season two and the series as a whole. They've got some of the most normal Disney cartoon plots of the season and yet are still very important to the main arc of the show. Overall, episode 13 serves to better characterize Hunter and make him more sympathetic before the coming conflict. It's the calm before the storm. Luz and Amity are relegated to the B-plot in this episode, trying to find the author of the Azura book series, who they believe might be a real witch hiding on the Boiling Isles. For his entire life, Hunter has only ever known the Emperor's Coven. It's clear his perceptions and priorities have been completely warped by that experience, and as a result, he has absolutely no riz. Teens are probably into the same things as me, like authority and rules. Did I use that right? I love that the writers brought in the character from the detention episode from season one, the one who was secretly studying multiple magic types, because they use her here to counter Hunter's argument. Do I want to study different kinds of magic? Heck yes, but why is joining Emperor's Coven my only option? The episode revolves around Willow starting a new sports club for Flyer Derby, since Grudgeby has already been monopolized at Hexside. Hunter decides that this would be the best way to find new members for the Emperor's Coven, and wants to prove himself to Darius and, by extension, Bellos. So he decides to try recruiting, or more accurately, capturing them. However, in spending time with Willow, Gus, and the others, he develops a connection with them, so he can't go through with it. It's not their anger that causes him to rethink his stance. It's the self-doubt that he sees in Willow when she thinks she's failed as a leader. Her reaction is a reflection of his own feelings. Hunter had such a distorted perception of what friendship even is that he honestly believed there was nothing wrong with kidnapping them. The episode not only shows his true character when separated from his role as the Golden Guard, it also proves that he makes an effective team member with the others and has the potential to be a good friend. Again, we have this recurring theme of trust in others being the most valuable power one can have. Meanwhile, Darius, the Abomination Covenhead, is revealed to be a more complicated character as he approves of Hunter letting the children go, making the morally correct choice. This indicates the possibility that some of the other Covenheads might not be so invested in the Emperor's ideology. We already know Rain didn't want to join them. Also, there's another Steve sighting in this episode. Never forget Steve! In episode 14, Luz is still avoiding contacting her mother, still running away from things as she has been this entire time. She seems to be avoiding thinking about it in general, her and my own anxiety building. Goddamn, I can relate. So instead, she helps Amity enter and compete in a fighting tournament to live out a dream, but also to impress her dad since he declared that she must try out for the Emperor's Coven. And, well, she really doesn't want to. Luz enters as well to help keep her mind off of things. In the B-plot, Ida is trying to get information from Warden Wrath, the incelish guard character from the first episode, about Bellos' plans. Amity's brother Edric joins her and King and reveals his knowledge of beast magic. The more we learn about many of these characters, the more we see how much this limitation of covens has led to familial expectations, which have in turn held everyone back from truly being themselves. 
Eventually, they're able to pry the information out of Wrath, learning that the Day of Unity will somehow unite all of magic kind with the Titan, and that not everyone seems happy about it. In the end, Amity finally tells her dad that she doesn't want to be a part of the Emperor's Coven. She asserts her own independence. Seeing her true self seemingly for the first time, Alador finally relents and accepts her decision. I really like that Amity doesn't just immediately forgive her father, shown by the fact that she doesn't accept his embrace and instead just shakes his hand. He has things to atone for, and while we should be open to forgive, that has to be earned and doesn't mean that we forget. Afterwards, Amity finds Luz, and we finally learned what happened to her father, why he's been absent. Up to this point, there was always a question mark on the subject. Nobody ever really mentioned him, though there were photos in Camilla's home with the three of them together, so we knew that it wasn't him abandoning them for another lover or anything like that. Instead, we find out that he passed away. That's why Luz was ignoring her mom. That's why she had been running from her own thoughts this episode, running from home, running in general. As much as she wanted to run from her pain, she just can't forget. Together, in a touching closing scene, the two pay their respects to the man. In episode 15, we finally get some background on Ida and Rain's early relationship, as well as some more between Ida and Lilith. As young girls, they were very close, and while Ida was still a rebel and got into trouble, we see that at least some of the times it was to cover for Lilith. In fact, this is the inciting event of the episode. Ida makes a literal Faustian bargain with Principal Faust. Okay, so kind of on the nose, but pretty damn well thought out. In return for not being expelled, she is sent to heck, help enhance Coven know-how, and forced to choose between giving up her new friend Rain and, in a way, her principles, her soul, or working with Rain and bucking the system, keeping her morals. Of course, we know what Ida's choice will be after all the time we've spent getting to know her. Rain is very much like Ida in terms of her steadfast sense of justice and natural talent at magic. However, they were the prototypical prodigy, bored with the tedium of constantly excelling at everything they do. They're also pretty shy, despite being a bard. They were especially bored at the conference before meeting Ida. She teaches them to cause mischief and to have fun again, even if it means getting into trouble. In return, they introduce her to apple blood, her favorite drink in the present. Oh, baby, time to stock up on mama's night juice. Even in this character study bottle episode, we get movement on the main plot. It's revealed that Rain wasn't actually under the influence of Terra's potion, hence why they didn't try to capture Ida during the events at the parade. Instead, this episode sets up an ability in the flashback that lets Rain change the structure of a liquid by whistling, and we see them do this at the end. They rejected Ida's rescue not because they were being mind-controlled, but because they wanted her to be safe. And in the final moments of the episode, we see that Bellows' plan for the Day of Unity is some sort of draining spell. Now, maybe I overused this term, but episode 16 begins in media res with Luz and Hunter together, somehow trapped in the Emperor's mind, similar to how she entered Willow's mind in the previous season. Perhaps I also overuse this term, but this is another example of magic literalism. Jazz hands. Then we snap back to the present. Luz, Ida, and King are all in the night market, where we see that the Emperor's propaganda is becoming more and more pervasive and ubiquitous. They visit a seamstress who turns them away as she herself joined a coven, eschewing life as a wild witch. One thing we learn here is that the Empire is only about 50 years old. I had thought it was much older than that, surely at least a few centuries given how entrenched the coven system is and how accepting everyone is of it. Then again, it only took about four years in our world for half the nation to go insane, so maybe it isn't all that unrealistic. Jazz hands. Anyways, Luz and Hunter inadvertently get caught in a spell that sucks them into Belos' mind, Kind of thought there'd be more to the explanation than that, but whatever. We see Belos' origins as a leader, leaving behind the identity of Philip Wittebay. He started out as what was effectively a street performer, a snake oil salesman, and slowly started spreading his rhetoric. He graduated to engineering false flag disasters, blaming wild magic to get people on his side. He shares this in common with some of the worst leaders in the history of the real world. I'm not talking about 9-11, Please keep the truth or shit out of my comment section. Okay, thanks. Yes. Later, we get the very first depiction of the Collector. We don't learn this yet, but the Collector is the reason Belos is able to use magic without glyphs or a witch's bile sack. Moreover, it's revealed that Hunter is nothing more than a clone, called a Grimwalker, and he's not even a first edition at that. He spends the entire episode, just as he spent his entire life, making excuse after excuse for Belos. 
Yet this inescapable fact sends him spiraling. What does it mean for his identity? What purpose does he have outside what he was given to him by Bellos? What self does he have outside of that? Before, Hunter was just following orders, but now, after this catalyst, he's able to reflect and think critically and understand how fucked up everything is. This change happens because of his interactions with the main characters, who showed him what a healthy relationship is supposed to look like. The entire time Luz and Hunter are inside the mindscape, they're being chased by what appears to be the monstrous side of Belos and following his inner child. However, there's a twist at the end where we learn the monster is actually a manifestation of all the palacemen that he has absorbed over the years, and the little child that they were following is the real Belos, conscious of the intrusion into his mind. This was a really well done twist, especially since it subverts our expectations from the episode in Willow's mind. Luz asks how all these witches could have been tricked into following a witch hunter. It's a great question, given how life on the Isles with wild magic seemed to be great when she went into the past. The episode is seemingly meant to make us question a lot of things about ourselves and our society. Who are we? What purpose do we have? And what does it say about our society when someone like Belos comes along and seemingly gives meaning to everything for a large portion of the population? He stirs up resentments and makes us wonder if abandoning these long-held values will create change and allow us to gain an advantage in the world. And of course, there's partial truth there, because sometimes such societal shifts are positive and help give voice to the voiceless. But behind Belos's rhetoric is only fear and hate of the unknown. The show takes a strong stance on these subjects, as when the totality of Belos's atrocities and lies are uncovered, his closest ally, the one person that had been unwaveringly loyal to him for so long gets the chance to leave and takes it without hesitation. Episode 17 gives us some closure to King's backstory. We're in the endgame now, folks. All of the dominoes that have been set up over the course of the last 35 episodes are finally starting to topple over. The action starts when Hootie coughs up an owl pellet containing the letter that was meant for King from earlier in the season. It says that there are more beings like King who call themselves the Titan Trappers and gives instructions on how to find them. For a while, it seems like everything is all right, that he had finally found his people and his place among them. It's everything he's wanted since the beginning of the show, or at least it's everything he thought he wanted. But truly, it's his found family, Luz, Ida, Lilith, and even Hootie, that he truly cares about. The reason why he falls so hard into the Trapper's community is because of his fear of losing Luz. That's a weird phrase. He knows about her promise to Camilla, to go back home and stay there, and can't cope. Part of the reason all of those Slice of Life episodes were so important, even if they didn't advance the plot, is again because it makes these moments and interactions so much more powerful and relatable, even in this fantasy setting. It's revealed that the Titan Trappers, well, trap Titans. Gotta give him one thing, they never really tried to hide it. They worship the Collector and are sworn to eliminate the last of the Titans, which we finally learn is who and what King is. And he just so happened to walk right into their village. They treat him as one of their own, as there are crossed wires on both sides, but realize their mistake and plan to sacrifice him. Luz and Hootie uncover the truth just in time to help him escape, but the home they're returning to is no longer there. Episode 18 takes place during the events of 17, while Luz and King are away, and the action really starts to heat up. Plus, it's another Gus-heavy episode. We haven't got one of those in a while. It begins with a flashback to when Gus first joined Hexide. We learn that he suffers from anxiety and panic attacks, and we get, I think, the best example and use of magic literalism of the series when it manifests as an uncontrollable illusion. His worst inner thoughts are echoed by his own magic, made visceral and visible to the world. Panic attacks are bad enough when they're stuck inside your own head, but being forced to physically watch them? Yikes. That's rough, buddy. Ah! Yet it gives us a clear insight into what it's like to suffer through one and not only how debilitating it is for the person having it, but also how hard it can be for others to help. Back in the present, he finds Hunter, who's been secretly living at Hexide since the events in Belos's mind. The Emperor's goons raid the school to force students to join the Covens for the Day of Unity. Predictably, that doesn't go over too well with the students. It's the first skirmish in the fight that has been building since the beginning. In order to interfere with the Imperial Force's plans, Gus once again goes all Aang Avatar state and creates an illusion that blankets the entire school. 
a feat that his self-conscious ass can't recognize for the unprecedented achievement that it is. He does this somewhat intentionally, though isn't in full control as visualized by his single glowing eye. Hunter has been having his own panic attacks since learning that he was a Grimwalker. He still doesn't have total control over them, but seems to have enough emotional intelligence and awareness of his problem to help Gus, which is more than I can say for myself. I went 33 years thinking my brain was normal, that it was normal to think people are always talking about me, which is a great thing to combine with being a very minor public figure and seeing thousands of comments about myself. But then as soon as I went on anti-anxiety meds, poof, all those racing thoughts were gone. Seriously, go see a doctor if you feel strange is I guess what I'm saying. Not really related to the show, but the whole conflict of this episode is seeing through illusion. Gus seeing through the illusion of his perceived incompetence, Hunter through his identity crisis, Willow's need for Amity to see her for who she truly is, and Amity's inability to do so. <laughs> Lucky shot, Willow. Hey, don't listen to her. You totally got me. Eventually, Gus goes full first episode Aang and loses control of the illusion altogether, both eyes glowing. His inner demons are consuming him through his magical panic attack, and this time it isn't only affecting him, but his friends as well. Hunter recognizes himself in Gus and is able to connect and help him release the illusion. It's a pretty great moment and episode overall that accurately depicts anxiety and hopefully helps kids to sympathize with mental health issues rather than the stigma against them so prevalent in mine and older generations. Once out of his panic attack, Gus realizes how irrational his anxiety over his choice of magic is, as he was able to take down a coven head single-handedly. Of course, it's important to note that this doesn't like magically heal him, but he's now at least more self-aware. At the end of the episode, Hunter is officially accepted into Hexside and reveals to everyone what the Day of Unity is truly about, though it cuts away before we get to here. Suffice to say that the Covens, the Collector, the Day itself were all engineered to commit genocide on all the witches and demons of the Boiling Isles. In episode 19, Luz, King, and Hootie return home to find that things have changed. The Owl House has been abandoned and ransacked. Bit of a hero's journey moment here. They catch up to Ida and Lilith hiding out in a cave and catch them up to the fact that King is actually a titan. And hang on, so that means that King has been walking around, on, among other things, on his dead dad's corpse this entire time? Did I read that right? Mm-hmm. Good lord, Dana, that's fucking dark. Also, they had a constant source of titan's blood under their nose this entire time. In their absence, Ida and Lilith decided to leave the children, and Hootie, out of their fight with Bellos. I really like this. Rather than relying on children to save the world, the adults do the responsible, you know, adult thing and send them away. Predictably, Luz does not like this very much. At the same time, despite Ida's feelings on the subject, there's no denying that Luz has been changed by all that she's been through. She's no longer the perfectly optimistic, bubbly character that we met in season one. Instead, she's been hardened by all of this adversity and trauma that she's gone through. On the one hand, it does make her a more badass protagonist, but on the other, the loss of innocence in such a way is kind of… sad. Meanwhile, King goes on a spiritual journey of self-discovery with the Steve, who himself is the symbol of opposition from within the Emperor's hierarchy. His character shows that not all of the Emperor's goons are mindless henchmen. Also, Steve is the older brother of Matholomew, which means their parents really must have hated their second kid. King finally makes peace with himself for the first time in the series, his character arc basically complete. And King deserves our praise! In the end, the main characters all meet up in Rain's hideout to discuss their plan to disrupt the Day of Unity. All of the characters are happy and together, so what could possibly go wrong? Well, episode 20 could happen, for a start. Ida gets branded in order to impersonate Rain and take their spot amongst the Covenheads, hopefully to corrupt the draining spell and stop it altogether. At this point, Ida's arc is basically fulfilled as well. She started the series as flippant, sarcastic, and careless, not really caring about anyone but King. She just couldn't allow herself to get close to them for fear of hurting someone like she did her father. She has gone from that to seeing Luz and King as her own children, to healing the rift with Lilith, to reconnecting with the one that got away, and even sacrificing the possibility to ever use wild magic again with their branding. Her heart has been resuscitated after being traumatized for so long by the curse and being a fugitive. 
In the B-plot, Luz and the other kids go to save Amity, who's been grounded by Mrs. Blight. Oh, crikey. Despite everything Amity's mother has put her through, she, Luz, and the others go to warn her parents about the Emperor's plans. It's here where you'd normally expect a parent to see the error in their ways, and for Alador, that does happen. He had already been trending towards being reformed since accepting Amity for who she is in the fighting tournament. However, Mrs. Blight just doubles down on being a gigantic, gaping asshole. She is the source of basically all of Amity's trauma, and she did just the same thing to the twins as well. They just didn't really speak out about it like Amity has. So narratively, after everything, it makes sense that she wouldn't be swayed. And when forced to choose between even the hint of power or her family, well... Fine. I've been meaning to find a more competent business partner anyway. She knew the plan, or at least thought she did, and she still helped. So Kikimura captures Luz, disguised as Hunter, and taking her to the Emperor, getting the face-to-face -face that Luz has been hoping for. And now we've arrived at the season two finale. Despite Ida's carefully prepared sabotage, Bellos' spell still goes forward due to his precautions, the best laid plans and all. Just like with Mrs. Blight, we get a couple final gut punches to drive home the fact that the Emperor has no moral bearing, that he has no interest or hope in being reformed. He admits to the Collector, who is clearly some sort of cosmic star child, that's a new term, right? I'm just gonna assume it is and not look it up that he never intended to free the being, and instead has simply been lying for hundreds of years. Color me surprised. But if that was messed up, then what he says to Kikimura, who just wants Senpai to notice her, is straight dirty. You want to help? Go find a hole to wither away in. Just as he's preparing to say bye to the demon realm and walk through the portal, Luce confronts him. Not only does Belos lie to others, he lies to himself. He tries to convince Luce that everything he's doing is to help people. And I think he might actually believe it. I think he truly feels that he is somehow saving them. He's completely deluded, of course, and it's very convenient that his plan only benefits himself. But people can pull themselves through some serious mental gymnastics to avoid making them feel like the bad guy. Each of the main characters have come face to face with their trauma and have been forced to deal with it in various ways. In contrast, Belos simply hasn't, at least as far as we know. He's never gotten really honest with himself about why he believes the things he does. It feels like a warning about trauma going unchecked and leading to egotistical delusion. He and Luz fight briefly, and though Luz is more skilled than she was in their last encounter, she's still clearly no match for Belos. However, her true strength was never in her raw power, but rather her ingenuity and quick thinking. She makes an offer to Belos that she knows he can't refuse. At the end of the day, Belos is lonely and wants someone with him to recognize what he's accomplished. Despite everything, he is still human after all, and so he falls hook, line, and sinker for her trick. Luz brands Belos, and his true monstrous nature is revealed and made physical when he turns into a tree beard looking motherfucker. The light goes dim again, casting everything in very serious shadows. For a moment, it feels like a horror film. Meanwhile, everyone on the Boiling Isles connected via the covens begin to fall as the spell takes hold, including Ida herself. It's honestly hard to watch, which is a testament not only to the writing, but to the animation and art design as well. Here, everything is underlit by this enormous sky beam, giving it a suspenseful campfire story-like vibe right up until the spell takes hold and the light goes out entirely, just as it starts to go out from the gathered witches. Again, very nice visual storytelling. King and Kikimura set free the Collector, who is revealed to indeed be a child, a seemingly all-powerful one who is effortlessly able to stop Bellows. He recognizes King as a child titan and offers to play, while the world seems to be crumbling around them. As it does, Luz and the others head towards the portal door to escape. King has grown a lot, over this season especially, and to save Luz's life, he's forced to make the choice to let her go, even though that was the thing he feared the most. Luz herself is forced to make a choice, living to fight another day or doing whatever she can to save Ida now, even if it means certain death. She leaves and King stays. And that's the end of the second season of The Owl House. It's pretty bleak. Though the Boiling Isles were saved from the draining spell, they've gone from the fire back into the frying pan with the Collector. 
At the same time, Luce, Amity, Willow, Gus, and Hunter are all trapped in the human realm as the portal collapses behind them, but not before what remains of Belos follows them through. As the credits roll, we're forced to sit and contemplate the events of the finale in the shack where the portal once stood, looking out into the human world. We are stuck there, just as Luce and the others are stuck. Season 2 of The Owl House was the follow-through promised by the final two episodes of the previous one. It took those revelations, the action, the conflict, and turned it all up to 11. Louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. None of the characters in the main cast are the same in episode 21 of season 2 as they were when we first met them. They've all gone through significant character growth. Luz has honestly gotten darker as a character since the events with Lilith, and the second season, especially towards the end, has forced her to mature. She is no longer a little girl, at least not at heart. Amity has accepted who she is, no longer the uptight, paranoid bully that we had originally met. Luz's optimism and love taught her to care for herself, to emancipate herself from her mother's will. King is no longer the self-centered, petty egomaniac that stole Luz's story for a little fame. Instead, he's had to grow up and accept who and what he is. Ida has also accepted herself, curse and all. She made peace with it, metaphorically and literally speaking, and became a stronger person for it. Willow and Gus have both realized their respective powers, learning to cope with their self-doubt and anxiety, respectively, manage it so that it doesn't control their lives, and they've both become a couple of badasses for the effort. Now, of course, the last episode was a pretty big cliffhanger. Obviously, Dana Terrace and the creative team behind the show couldn't just leave things unfinished like that. Though our heroes beat Belos, the day was far from saved. Originally, they planned to make at least another full season of the show that would have wrapped up things in a more methodical way. However, it was not to be. In October of 2021, amidst the pandemic, Dana Terrace posted on Reddit acknowledging and giving context to the cancellation. First and foremost, I want to clarify something. The reason, at least according to Terrace, had nothing to do with the queer and trans representation in the show. Of all the problems I have with Disney as a mega corporation, one place where they have seemingly made strides in the past few years is such representation. Of course, that doesn't make them saints, but we should have the truth. In the post, she gave the real reason for the cancellation. At the end of the day, there are a few business people who oversee what fits into the Disney brand. And one day, one of those guys decided the Owl House didn't fit that brand. The story is serialized, barely, compared to any average anime. Our audience skews older, and that just didn't fit this one guy's tastes. That's it. Ain't that wild? really grinds my guts, boils my brain, kicks my shins, all the things. Basically, Disney prefers its cartoons to be episodic. I've talked about this idea in previous videos, but it basically wants shows where the viewer can hop in at any time and not be missing any plot developments. For example, think of something like SpongeBob or Looney Tunes. I find this particularly strange though, since the historical reasoning behind the preference towards episodic shows was related to broadcast television being well, broadcast. Usually just once. In other words, missable. But streaming services kind of made such reasoning obsolete. The only other explanation is what she said, that such plots are just too complex for younger kids. That may have been the reasoning for one of the executives she mentioned, except we know that isn't really true given how big the show was both in terms of ratings at the time of release and in the tidal wave of internet support that followed. Many of those fans were still children, and regardless of the fact that they didn't cancel it for being too woke on LGBTQ characters, they still canceled a show that was huge for queer and trans kids and young adults, who don't have a lot of people like them represented on most kid-friendly platforms. Regardless, the show did technically get a third season, just not the one that was planned. Instead, the conclusion to the series would be told in three hour-long installments released in 2022. Dana had this to say about the change. Even getting the Consolation season three episodes was difficult, apparently. Hard to say. I wasn't allowed to be part of any conversations until I was just told. Wasn't even allowed to present my case. Love the transparency and openness here. This is sarcasm. So unlike some other shows, at the very least, we got closure on the story even if it wasn't what was planned. 
And honestly, other than some things feeling rushed in these episodes, which is kind of hard to avoid, I'm pretty happy with the way things ended. So without further ado, let's unpack the final season of The Owl House. The first special picks up right where we left off the last episode, and goddamn is the first line heartbreaking. Luce, you're the best big sister I could have ever asked for. Luce and the others make it to her house. She is finally, after 40 episodes, reunited with her mother, and it's just as emotional as such a thing should be. Remember, she's still a kid. Did you ever stay away from home at that age for a week or a month? Do you remember how homesick you felt even after the first few days? Well, Luce was gone for at least three months. Honestly, that alone, coupled with the fact that for a time she had no feasible way to return, would be traumatic enough for a kid, let alone everything else she went through. But wait, there's more trauma. Let's see what they've worn. Luz gets to go home today with some brand new guilt for ostensibly being the one to give Belos the means to subjugate the Boiling Isles, essentially being the cause of this entire show's conflict. Not only that, but Hunter is still hiding the fact that he's a Grimwalker, a clone of Belos' witch hunter friend, because he thinks that nobody will accept him for it. Now, rationally speaking, I understand Luz's fear, but Hunter's does seem a little silly considering they were all friends with literal demons, but that's what makes irrational fears, you know, irrational. What follows is a brand new intro sequence to the show. It's a montage depicting the kids' lives as they adapt to living in the human realm over the course of multiple weeks, if not months. Luz comes out as bisexual to her mom, who accepts her and Amity as a couple. Hunter cuts his hair, V gets a new human form, and they all try multiple times to recreate the portal door, to no avail. We pick back up with Luz in school, reading about a hero who had a journey not unlike herself, only to return home to find it different than when she left, a la Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. We get some recontextualization about the inciting incident of the series, namely that Camilla really liked Luz's originality and wanted her to express herself, but felt pressured by the school's principal to make her conform. Meanwhile, Amity and the others have been hiding out in the shack while Luz is at school, they find a map leading to Titan's blood, which can help them get back to the Boiling Isles, so they follow it into town, in human disguises, of course. Hunter, I don't think the world is ready for the brave fashion choices of the year 2008. Please change. Don't listen to her. No, no, she's right. It was a dark time, what with all the affliction shirts and high-rise thongs poking out of low-rise jeans, or maybe it was just weird whenever I wore them both at the same time. Hunter finally has a family the one thing he's always wanted, and when he gets it, he becomes understandably emotional. It's why he stayed loyal to Belos for so long, even through the abuse. And unfortunately, a piece of Belos is still with him. It's another great example of magic literalism. Often, a small part of our abusers stay with us even after we've left, like a little parasite eating away at us from the inside, leeching our strength until we do something about it. Only, in Hunter's case, the parasite is very literal as well. We also learn what the stick up Belos' butt is. Turns out, Caleb, the person Hunter is cloned from, was his older brother, and he ran off with a witch, leaving Belos alone on the Boiling Isles. From that, he understandably has some abandonment issues that manifest into hyper-independence. Belos doesn't want to truly rely on others, therefore he cannot trust anyone, which perpetuates his loneliness eventually leading to his downfall. As I discussed earlier, one of the big themes of the Owl House is the importance of relying on and trusting others, and how knowing yourself and being open with others is actually the best power of all. Belos can't achieve that because he cannot face himself, so even though his trauma is valid, after all his big brother left him alone in a strange world, the way he dealt with it is absolutely not. Sounds like big bro got a hot witch girlfriend and little bro got upset. But that's just me. So it was never really even about the witches. They were just the target because he perceived them as stealing his brother. Then again, when has prejudice ever been founded on anything logical? N never. The answer is never. The Bellows Parasite eventually takes over Hunter's body, leading to yet another confrontation between him and Luce. He reveals to the group that Luce was responsible for his ascension. It's again the issues we just discussed manifesting here. He thinks revealing the information will ostracize Luce and cause her to stoop to his level. Yet, despite Luce's fears, Amity and the others aren't really phased by the revelation outside some initial confusion. 
that's the Belos you've been fighting this whole time? Everything they've been through together gives them the trust that anything she did was unintentional. This is unconditional love, something Belos has never experienced. So all of the major fight scenes of the series have been absolute bangers, and this one is no different. The animation is superb, and having Luce and the others working in tandem is really cool to watch. If it wasn't already clear, the fight shows that they've all grown, and grown closer to one another. Hunter decides that he's finally had enough, and is ready to discard the lingering part of Belos within him, so he fights back. It forces Belos out of his body and back into his monstrous form. However, doing so takes a toll mentally and physically, and Hunter only survives because Flapjack, his palisman, sacrificed itself to save him. R.I.P. Flapjack. Pour one out for the homie. Belos uses the Titan's blood that the kids found in town to make a portal to the Demon Realm, and our heroes follow him through, this time including Camilla. In the second special, we witness what happened after Luz and the others left the Boiling Isles. The Collector's takeover is as majestic as it is tragic. King, now emotionally mature, is able to steer this personification of chaos to limit the damage. So instead of wiping out the Isles, he convinces the Cosmic Child to play a game of Owl House. And so the entity takes this very literally, making all of the residents of the Boiling Isles into dolls to use for his amusement. This is straight up nightmare fuel and is eerily reminiscent of that one Pokemon episode where Sabrina turns Brock and Misty into puppets. <laughs> That actually did give me nightmares as a kid. After following her friends through the portal, Luce wakes up in the world between worlds. She sees something there, but can't quite make it out before being sucked into the demon realm, which is now just a giant playhouse for the collector. Each of the kids are processing their trauma, or not, in their own way. Gus is just a sad boy, which is not too bad, all things considered. Willow is basically gritting her teeth and refusing to admit any weakness or take any time to just be scared. She feels the urge to take everyone else's problems on to avoid dealing with their own. Hunter is going manic as he feels useless and alone without Flapjack, showing signs of PTSD. Meanwhile, Luce and Amity have each other to rely on, relationship goals. Specifically, Luce has been anxious since deciding to leave the Boiling Isles out of some lingering, misplaced guilt. Her palisman hasn't hatched yet either, adding to the stress. And Camilla is just trying not to lose her shit. Uh, okay, okay. The eyeballs on the ground are normal, but the little space cherub is the danger? After making their way to Bonesboro and witnessing the horror that the Collector has created, the group hide within Hexide, which houses refugees that manage to escape notice. There's this sort of Lord of the Flies situation going on here, where Basha and Kikimura in disguise have taken over control of the school in a power grab with the excuse that they are providing peace and structure. Eventually, Kikimura reveals herself and ambushes Luz's group, sending them running in different directions. As I mentioned, Willow has been holding back her feelings, shoving them down for a while now. Throughout the episode, though, they begin to leak out, slowly at first, but by this point she can no longer keep them in. With no safety valve, she begins to explode, losing all control of her magic as she has a nervous breakdown. This part of the show is also terrifying, like the show suddenly switched genres to horror as everything becomes covered in vines, strangling anyone unlucky enough to be nearby. Eventually though, Gus and Hunter are able to calm her down and get her magic back under control. Meanwhile, Luce escapes with Camilla into the woods, where her anxiety about leaving reaches a crescendo. Unlike before though, Luce has her mother who has fully embraced her for the young lady that she is. Camilla helps to soothe her and to realize what she has wanted since the very beginning is just to be understood. The epiphany is the catalyst that finally causes her palisman to hatch, turning into a snake shifter. Her name is Stringbean, and she's perfect! Back in the Collector's Palace, Belos has taken control of Rain's puppet body. That was a really convoluted sentence to write. Anyways, he sees that the Collector is suspicious that King is conspiring with Ida and Lilith, who, by the way, aren't puppets. Yay! So Bellows preys on the Collector, not yay. As despite the fact that he is an omnipotent being, he's also mentally a child. The episode ends with the Collector ominously declaring a new game. The series finale begins with everyone getting snatched up by the Collector, and then everything goes dark. The next thing we see, Luz wakes up in the Emperor's palace and runs into Amity, who blames her for helping Bellows. She later has similar interactions with the rest of the group. 
It becomes clear that she, as well as King and Ida, are all under the Collector's spell, who has brought their worst fears to life. Though it does take a minute, Luce is able to see through this illusion as she's already dealt with this particular fear, not to mention her encounter with Grom, so she knows that the real Amity still loves her. The realization allows her to escape the spell, where she then uses light glyphs to free Ida and King in turn. We learn that at some point in the distant past, the Collector was manipulated by others of his kind into befriending the Titans, as he just wanted somebody to play with. And when he did, the other Collectors betrayed him. They believed the Titans to be a threat to their purpose, and began systematically exterminating them, causing King's dad to think that the Collector was complicit. That's why he was sealed in the Relic. That's why King's people are gone. That's the ultimate genesis of everything that's transpired. Just like Luz, Ida, and King, and the rest of them, the Collector is just an outcast. A nearly omnipotent outcast, but still an outcast. Luz helps him realize that and convinces him to join their side. During all of this, Rain manages to expel the Bellows Parasite from their body, but not before bringing him to the Titan's heart. There, the once Emperor merges with this long-dead creature and begins to swallow the Boiling Isles whole with its corruption. Each of the heroes tried to take the creature down, but it seems there's no hope against the fused monster. Even the Collector almost bites it, attempting to reason with the Bellows thing. But just as Bellos' attack is about to kill him, Luz steps in to save the day, sacrificing herself. She goes out staying true to her values. The Collector, who was, just a few minutes ago, an enemy with power beyond measure, was treated with kindness at the end. This is exactly the kind of principle that both Camilla and Ida instilled in her. She wakes up in the world between worlds again, coming face to face with the creature from before. Turns out it's actually King's father and mother. Apparently, Titans reproduce asexually. Not sure I needed to know that, but now we all do. And I guess it also means that even though there's only one member left, their race is not doomed. Cool. He tells Luce at this point, Bellos' mind is too far gone. He's sunk so low into depravity that he's more a force of chaos than a person, and there's no possible way to reach him. And so, he sends Luz back into the demon realm, imbued with his magic, a deus ex titania. This is Luz in her final form. She comes back a total badass and defeats Bellos once and for all, and damn, was it ever a good send-off for the show. The animation was never bad in the previous seasons, and there were definitely highlights among other fight scenes, but these specials and this last fight took it to a whole other level. The way they play with lighting in similar ways to other fight scenes, the camera movements and scale are all incredible. In the end, Luce finally got her wish to be a badass like Azura, and damn it was glorious. Now we After the battle with the Titan of the Boiling Isles finally, officially dead, the glyphs Luz used, that's really hard to say, Luz used, the glyphs Luz used no longer work and the empowerment gifted to her by King's dad fades. <coughs> There's a time skip and we next see her four years later, graduating from high school. She returns to the Boiling Isles for college and we see that all of her friends have made wonderful lives for themselves, each fitting their character. Hunter became a palisman carver in memory of Flapjack who first softened his heart. Willow is a professional flyer derby player, continuing her ascent to badassery. Amity followed in her father's footsteps and became an abomination engineer, her relationship with Luz still going strong. Gus's obsession with all things human never waned, so he now teaches about them at the university. Speaking of which, Ida is the headmaster there, once again getting to watch over Luz and the other kids. King has come into his own as a titan, able to make his own glyphs like his father before him. The final shot of the show is a touching send-off, as King and the Collector give us a final light show, saying goodbye one last time. It may not have been the final season that fans wanted, or the one intended by the creators, but what we got was beautiful in its own right. Narratively speaking, everything just worked pretty flawlessly. It's obvious that the writers must have put in a titanic, nice, effort for that to be the case. I can't imagine that condensing such a storyline down to, in effect, six total episodes could have been an easy task. In fact, the writing as a whole over all three seasons was really tight. My only real complaint being that the plot took so long to take off, even if it was for a good reason, and that Luz didn't really have a strong tie to the fight with the Emperor outside of protecting her friends. 
well, at least until midway through season two. But overall, each of the characters were fully realized and had consistent and understandable character arcs. That is kind of a rare thing among Disney cartoons, and such serialization is apparently the main reason it got canceled. Regardless, just like Infinity Train, it stands as a great example of countering fascist, racist ideology in the Emperor, and how such things are founded on nonsense, about how a person surrounding themselves with people that love and care for them is the best way to overcome trauma, and how not doing so can lead them down a destructive path. It also provided great representation, not only for LGBTQ youth, but also neurodivergent kids. Luz is, to my knowledge, the only bisexual protagonist in a cartoon, definitely one from Disney. Rain was equal parts silly and strong and was a great role model for non-binary kids to aspire to. Seeing Gus's panic attacks and Willow's breakdown is really important to show kids that there's nothing to be ashamed about when it comes to mental health. The Owl House ended its run as one of the most popular shows on Disney, and continues to spark imaginations, as evidenced by the seemingly endless number of fan creations. Despite it being only a year past, it already lives on as a classic in the eyes of many of its fans, and that is an achievement very few shows manage. Anyways, thank you guys very much for checking out this video. Sorry it took so long to be released. I had a surgery last month that put me out of commission for a bit, and even after healing, my writing was pretty slow. So it gives me great pleasure to announce that I now have a writing partner for the channel. She's already had an impact by helping me whip this script into shape, and she'll be actually writing stuff with me going forward. Oh, and also she's an English teacher as well, so, you know, the guy that commented this on my moral oral video can suck it. She likes the video, so... Yeah, no, it was pretty bad. Uh, she, she was kidding. You were kidding, right? No. Uh, on that note, if you thought this video was a hoot and want to support the channel, you can do so on my Patreon or just by subscribing to the channel and hitting like and... You know what? That's it. I'm, I'm done. I will see you in the next one. Also, huge thank you to Jay DeVita, George Stevenson, Victor Ovidlu Slupik, sorry if I mispronounced that, Mecha Messiah, and John for becoming my latest patrons. You guys rock. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> I am so sorry. Oh, that's cool. That'll be good for Apologies. like the blooper reel. Apologies. <laughs>